so how often are you experiencing sort of tranquility or joy or pride or affection, curiosity, um, and negative emotions as well? Um, so that's being happy in your life. And happy people tend to have more positive emotions throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, and then being happy with your life, that's kind of when you review your life and you ask yourself, you know, am I satisfied with my life? Am I progressing towards my life goals and sort of at the rate that, that I want to be? And so you really kind of need both of those components to be happy. And that's how I define happiness. That was Sonia Lubomirsky on Psychologist Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting-edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado, and co-author of Act Daily Journal. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, co-author with Debbie on Act Daily Journal and practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. I am here with Katie Rothfelder, who is our dissemination coordinator, and we thought we'd bring her on because we talk a lot about Praxis, how Praxis sponsors this podcast. They offer online continuing education for professionals, everything from DBT to ACT training to compassion-focused therapy, and Katie's had some personal experience with Praxis that I think would be helpful for you to all learn about. Yeah, Diana, I started out with Stephen Hayes Act Immersion Program, and that was really my first chance to get, you know, really into ACT. And then since then, I've had these kind of on-demand course opportunities. Um, the one that really sticks out to me is Lou Lasbugato's Feedback Enhanced ACT course, which was this really beautiful mix of instruction for really difficult ACT concepts and then in-depth learning with practice. That grew my muscles as a, a brand new clinician so much. So if you are interested in taking a Praxis course, go ahead and go to our website, offtheclockpsych.com, and we have a discount code for you for some of the live courses. Check them out, Praxis Continuing Education. If you're a healthcare worker or a mental health therapist, you may find that some of your clients are caught in a tug of war with food and weight. They battle their body image and eating and are entangled in preoccupation about weight or feeling stuck in cycles of rigid dieting, overeating, shame, or hopelessness. I'm going to be offering a live online webinar with PESI Continuing Education on using ACT for eating and body image concerns. And then I hope you'll join me on Friday, December 3rd, 2021 from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can learn more through my events page at drdianahill.com. Hope to see you there. This is Yael here with Diana to introduce an episode with happiness researcher Sonia Lubomirsky. She's done research for the past several decades on happiness, and she's also come out with several books for lay audiences that translate her many scientific findings on how to cultivate greater happiness in your life. The two books are The How of Happiness and The Myths of Happiness. And her work is just so wide reaching in terms of the various ways that we can craft more happiness in our lives. And Diana, I was curious what, what stuck out for you in terms of the ways that you build happiness that fit with her research. Well, first of all, I just really appreciate having her on the show. I mean, she's been such an influence on the field of psychology and man, she rattles out a lot of happiness tips in this episode. So get out your pen and paper or your notes on your phone because you'll want to write a few things down. Or things, you can download the transcript. Or download the transcript. Yeah. And, um, you know, things like gratitude and the right dose, you know, and, and breaking up pleasurable events, but not negative ones. But what I was reflecting a lot when I was listening to your interview on is how much happiness has to do with our expectations, our mindsets, and our perception. And I was actually thinking about this experience I had yesterday at the DMV, which is a place where a lot of us go with negative expectations. It's sort of like an unhappy place. And so I got there with my computer, like kind of ready to just experience unhappiness. And the reality was that I got so engrossed in a blog that I was writing, it became quite lovely. And they kept on calling my number, but I forgot to go, 
to listen. And finally, someone came and found me and they pulled me up and they were joking around about how they're going to send a search committee out. And it was just this delightful little banter I had with this guy at the DMV. Meanwhile, I'm watching 16 year olds take their tests and how enjoyable it was to watch them take their exam and how cute they were. And I bounced out of that DMV happy as a clam. So I think what I'm kind of reflecting on is that a lot of times we try and pursue happiness or force it. And in doing so, it makes us less happy. But if we shift our expectations a little bit, maybe the contrast, we don't have have to have our expectations so high, but also just be grateful for the experiences that we have. It can really change them. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's something that I've been reflecting on that is sort of embodied in what you're saying, Diana, which is that the way that we approach our life, you know, through our thoughts and our actions has such an impact on our happiness. And this is something that's really fundamental in her research because she sort of separates out that there are genetic predictors of happiness and then there's life circumstances, but then there's these intentional actions that we can take both with our thoughts and with our body that um, can really change how happy we feel moment to moment and sort of throughout the course of our, our life. And for me, I think I didn't realize how much we influence our own happiness. This is kind of a funny thing because I went into clinical psychology. So one would imagine that I had some idea that happiness was something that could be built or, you know, that unhappiness was something that could be reduced. But it was really in the first year of my graduate school experience. And I referenced this while I was talking to Sonia Lubomirsky because I actually come from a family with a lot of mental health issues, a lot of depression and anxiety. And I think I had always just assumed that that was just kind of how I was. I was going to go through life feeling pretty down. And I was ex- and, and going to grad school really exacerbated whatever mood issues I came into the world with uh, genetic loading for. And I had this very pivotal like aha moment that was with a conversation uh, that I was having with a dear friend of mine from college. And she was getting really fed up with me just being very negative about grad school and and how I was doing and all of my social anxiety. And she said this thing to me that has stuck with me for ever since then. Now it's been several decades later. Um, And it was just this one phrase, choose to be happy. And it was just this moment where I was like, "I, I can do that. I can make that choice. The work that Sonia Lubomirsky does has really fed into that aha moment of saying, you can make choices, right? There are some things that are not in our control, and therefore it's not our fault if we're struggling with our mood and with our happiness. But there are ways that we can learn to relate to our thoughts, to our feelings, and and to learn how to act in the world that can really have a positive effect on how we feel as we move through life. And for me, that's just been a life-changing realization. And so I hope that people really take to heart and learn some of the activities and and different strategies that Sonia Lubomirsky teaches that can really help them to build greater happiness, regardless of what they come into the world with. I love that, Yael. And I think also the connection that you had with a friend there that was radically honest with you. You know, I think sometimes it's hard to be radically honest with people. And at the same time, I think there's a bit of controversy in the field of positive psychology, right? That, that we're supposed to be happy faces all the time and that, um, happiness is something that it should be the goal in life. And that's why I really like sort of this balance of there's, there's pleasure, there's happiness, there's joy, there's savoring the good and gratitude. And then there's also the other aspects of well-being, like meaning. And that's something that we talked about before on the um, episode with Paul Bloom. And really that sometimes we're going to have, that we're going to have discomfort. We're going to have DMV experiences and how we relate to them is what's important. So, yeah. And she does, she actually refers to Paul Bloom. I don't, she hadn't known that we were having him on the podcast, um, but she refers to him a couple of times and talks about this sweet spot, which is the title of his book. And, and I think that really does speak to this idea that you're articulating, Diana, which is that, you know, we can't be happy all the time. And in fact, that shouldn't be the goal, but there's this sweet spot of trying to kind of turn towards thoughts and actions that work better for us and building more happiness and more meaning while allowing for some of the uncomfortable things that are also a part of life, also a part of living and in kind of a necessary part. And Barbara Fredrickson, another really prominent happiness psychologist's work, talks about that there's this optimal ratio of having three positive experiences to one negative experience, but that we need the negative because that 
helps keep us on track, motivates us in some ways, keeps us aware of dangers. People who are flourishing tend to have more positive fewer negative experiences, and that using some of the strategies that Sonia Lubomirsky talks about, we can be better equipped to achieve that more optimal ratio, that sweet spot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also some of the neuroscience coming out showing that if we are just hyper stimulating our dopamine systems all the time, it's actually going to counterbalance with the opponent process theory so that we're going to experience more pain. So sometimes moving towards pain is the key to happiness as well. So yes, the sweet spot of embracing pain and pursuing meaning and hopefully feeling some pleasure along the way. Yeah. So we hope that you all get a lot out of this episode. I'm beyond excited to have Sonia Lubomirsky, one of the world's leading experts in happiness science as a guest today. Dr. Lubomirsky studies happiness interventions, exploring how individuals grow and sustain greater happiness. She's a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Riverside, and has translated happiness science for non-academic audiences in her two incredible books, The How of Happiness, A Scientific Approach to Getting the Life You Want, and also The Myths of Happiness, What Should Make You Happy But Doesn't, What Shouldn't Make You Happy But Does. And Dr. Lubomirsky is also mother of four, which just amazes me given how prolific she is. Welcome. It's great to be here. Thank you. I actually wanted to start our conversation by diving into a specific area of your research, but one that I think has pretty expansive themes. So as you know, and probably most of our listeners know, relationships are a critical factor in happiness, but of course carry enormous complexity in how they make us happier or unhappier. And one particular kind of relationship widely thought to make people less happy is the parent-child relationship. Now, you're a mother of four. I'm a mother of three. And I think we both know how complicated these relationships are. But there's this sort of prevailing idea in our culture that parents tend to be less happier. And there's some science that backs it up. So, for example, Nobel Prize winner Danny Kahneman has an extremely well-cited study of Texas-based working women that shows that parenthood and caring for children in particular generates about as much happiness as cleaning the house or commuting. So not much happiness. But you conducted some follow-up research and have a study that I love titled In Defense of Parenthood, Coming to a Different Conclusion. So I'm wondering what we can take away from these studies, both in terms of how complicated it is to determine what predicts happiness and also how research can sometimes unwittingly contribute to some of these erroneous beliefs, these myths about what makes us happy or unhappy. Thanks, Yael. I, uh, I've been actually thinking about this very question very recently because Paul Bloom has a new book out, and I was just reading his um, piece in The Atlantic about uh, sort of parenthood and, and happiness and misery. And it is indeed a very complicated question. I'm going to start with a study by Danny Kahneman, um, where I believe the item that people rated was, I think it was caring for children. Maybe it was babysitting. Um, and I've always had an issue with that item because a lot of the time that I spend with my children, I wouldn't necessarily categorize as sort of babysitting or caring. So if I'm having dinner with my child, I'm seeing a movie with my child, that would not be sort of part of that category. When I'm thinking about sort of babysitting, that's usually not as sort of happiness inducing. So that's a, that's a critique of that study. I mean, not, I mean, they, they didn't set up to, they didn't set out to, uh, to determine sort of whether parenthood or parenting makes people happy. Um, um, so basically the research is quite nuanced in this, in this area. And, uh, my former student, Katie Nelson and Costa Kushlev and I have a paper uh, a psych bulletin paper that basically reviews sort of all this literature and asks, you know, are parents happier than people who don't have children? And the answer is it depends. You know, it depends on a lot of things. It depends on whether you're a parent who are who's young, whether you're married and a parent, you know, it depends on the child, like the age of the child. Obviously, it's very different when you have a newborn versus a teenager versus a, a grown, you know, child who's 30 versus uh, an eight. I mean, I have an eight and a 10 year old in there. It's a lovely age, um, uh, sort of that between, you know, early childhood and adolescence. And so it, it depends on so many factors. And so it's almost like a ridiculous question to ask, like, are parents unhappy? Well, it sort of depends on lots of factors. Um, also, it depends what you're measuring. Are you measuring sort of happiness? Are you measuring meaning, you know, which is uh, very much related to happiness? Happiness and meaning tend to go together. Most parents report more meaning than people who don't have children. Uh, gender is a big factor. So we have a study... That's from a couple of years ago that shows that 
there's a, there are gender differences. It turns out that uh, fathers tend to be quite a bit happier than men without children. It's really that men without children that seem to be sort of the unhappy group. Um, mm-hmm. Mothers tend not to differ so much whether they have children or not. It could be because mothers tend to sort of uh, bear the brunt of, of child care. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a great question. It's something that I've been interested in for a long time. And actually, I got interested in it um, f- because when Stumbling on Happiness came out uh, by Dan Gilbert, there was a lot of press about sort of this issue that parents are unhappy. And so it always made me think like, gosh, I, I just feel like that's just sort of too simplistic an answer. And so, so you know, my former student, Katie Nelson, kind of dove into that question. Yeah, and I think it's so important to highlight the the nuance of happiness, both in terms of what predicts it, but also in how we experience it, because you're pointing out that it can both be the the pleasure that we experience moment to moment, but also, also the deeper meaning that we derive from engaging in, in specific roles. In that In Defense of Parenthood paper, we also looked at something else, which is that it's one thing when you ask parents kind of like overall, you know, how satisfied are you with your life? You know, I might be asked this question right now, I'm at work. And, um, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, well, I have these kids. Yes, yeah, sure. I'm happy. And I don't really think about like moment to moment when I'm actually with the kid and they're having a tantrum or, you know, or I have to clean up after them. And so we also, we also had a study where we asked, where we sort of asked people sort of throughout the day, you know, uh, kind of, um, uh, experience sampling study, you know, are you happier when you're actually with your kids? And we found that parents are you know, sort of as happy or as happier, even when they're with their kids. So that was a little bit surprising. So there's all sorts of different methodologies that one can use to get at the question. You might get somewhat different answers. Yeah. Well, and so let's get to that. So so I started specific and now I'm going to go a little bit more global, but sometimes research can get pretty granular in defining happiness, either as pleasure, psychological richness, meaning, positive affect. When you think about happiness in your research and in your writing, what is it that you're striving to help folks build? It's a great question. Well, the, uh, yeah, there's the, lots of definitions of happiness. And the definition that I tend to use is one that a lot of researchers in my field use that was developed by Ed Diener, who is the founder of the science of happiness. And, and this is the idea that happiness really has two components. Uh, and I like to think about it as being happy in your life and being happy with your life. So being happy in your life is basically sort of moment to moment, day to day. How often are you experiencing positive emotions and negative emotions, right? So how often are you experiencing sort of tranquility or joy or pride or affection, curiosity um, and negative emotions as well? Um, So that's being happy in your life and happy people tend to have more positive emotions throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, And then being happy with your life, that's kind of when you review your life and you ask yourself, you know, am I satisfied with my life? Am I progressing towards my life goals and sort of at the rate that that I want to be? And so you really kind of need both of those components to be happy. And that's how I define happiness. You know, other other ways of thinking about well-being, well-being is more of like an umbrella term that encompasses kind of everything, including physical health and all kinds of sort of inputs into happiness, um, might include things like engagement or meaning. And to me, those aren't really happiness. Those are really, um, you know, inputs into happiness or contributors to happiness or correlates of happiness. Yeah. And one one area of your research that I think is really striking and has received a ton of press is this idea that there's kind of three central predictors of happiness. There's uh, genetics, life circumstances, and intentional activities. And I know you want to stay away from like quantifying exactly how much each contributes, but why is it important to lay out the different predictors in terms of how this empowers folks to work on cultivating their own happiness? Well, I think it's important for people to sort of understand um, uh, kind of where happiness comes from, kind of what determines it. And, um, you know, I, when I was writing my uh, first book, The How of Happiness, I, I talked to a lot of people about happiness and, and I was surprised that some people, in fact, I even have an anecdote in the book about my own brother who said, well, happiness, that's something you either have it or you don't, you know? And mm-hmm. I was like, really? My own brother thinks that? Like, he just thought it was sort of genetic, all genetic, you know, either, you, either you're happy or you're not. And I, I'm like, well, actually, that's not really true. And and of course, there's there's a genetic component to happiness, just like there is to like any human trait. Um, so so I think it's important for people to people to understand kind of like, well, you know, how happy you are, kind of overall, you know, day to day, you know, this year, this month, um, has to do with yeah, it has something to do with your genetics. Because some people really are kind of happier than others, and they don't have to work very hard at it. Um, but some of it has to do with your life circumstances. Like if you're in a in a really bad relationship or you don't have a lot of money or you live in an air in a place where there's a lot of 
you know, instability or uncertainty or, you know, crime or a war going on, right? You're going to be less happy. Um, and so your life circumstances matter as well. But also what matters is sort of what, what you yourself are doing and thinking kind of there's sort of intentional activities, sort of intentional things that you can, you can do, you can make a choice to do in your daily life that also impact your happiness. So, so I think I like the kind of laying it out this way, because uh, for the lay person, when they understand it, then they can kind of see, oh, okay, well, gee, like maybe my life circumstances are okay. You know, I sort of have my basic needs met, but I'm still not happy. You know, maybe, maybe I'm just sort of unlucky, but there's things that I can do to, to be happier if I want to be, because a lot of this takes effort. And so not everyone wants to put the effort in, but if you want to put the effort in, there's sort of daily kind of exercises that you can work on to be happy. So I think it's, it's good for people to have that kind of big picture because it sort of helps them understand why they're happy or unhappy and then, and then decide, make a decision. Like, do I want to do something about it or do I want to sort of leave it alone? Yeah. To me, I think it's really powerful in, in sort of helping people be self-compassionate if they're not happy, that it's not just because you're making bad choices or doing the wrong things, but there are some factors that are largely out of your control. And yet it's also empowering to know, as you're saying, that there's a lot that you can do to shift the dial, that you might have a set point, as you talk about in a lot of your work, but that you can raise it through through effort. And I I kind of have started to think about this as like, mindset, right? It's sort of a bit of inducing a growth mindset around happiness. Absolutely. It's funny. For many, many years, we actually have wanted to do a growth mindset study, you know, where we kind of try to induce a growth mindset in people about happiness. That would be um, so cool. Yeah. And, and, and we never kind of got around to it. And then actually someone did that or someone did a study that was very similar to that, that I remember finding. I thought, well, okay, well, good. Someone else, someone else <laughs> has done. So the idea is that, right, if you kind of um, try to persuade people that happiness is something you can change, that's something that's malleable, that they're more likely to kind of put put the effort into it. Um, and, and even longer ago, um, I was interested in cultural differences in happiness. Um, I I'm, I'm, was born in the Soviet Union. And actually, one of the reasons that I got interested in happiness is when I was 10 years old and I came to the US, I kind of noticed these huge differences in sort of how happy people looked or acted um, from like between Soviet Union, Russia and, and the US. Um, and so I came back to Russia, you know, when it when it became Russia um, in the '90s, um, and, I, and one of the questions I asked was about kind of the malleability of happiness. Like, do you think happiness is something you can control, something you can change? And and Russians were much less likely to say yeah. that happiness was something that was malleable. And so that is something, you know, that that is sort of um, a stable construct, also, I guess, in our minds uh, that that one can measure. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So I have an Israeli background, and I would say it's fairly similar. At least I was raised in a family where um, the assumption was you're you're born with a certain happiness level or depression, and there's not much you can do about it. And it was really in graduate school that I had this sort of aha moment of, oh, I can make a change. I can make choices. And it was it was really um, kind of a pivotal moment in my life. And I think reading books like yours really empowers people to say, you know, I may have come into the world with these circumstances and this genetic loading, but there are certain things that I can do. And there's real strong science supporting the the efficacy of making these kinds of changes and, and changing sort of how satisfied I am day to day and more globally. I yeah, absolutely. Really I agree with everything you just said. Yeah. Um, but I do want to sort of take note of, you know, the fact that there's these, there's several sort of blocks to increasing your happiness. And and you write a lot about a concept known as hedonic adaptation, which is a huge factor that impacts our happiness. So I wonder if you can explain what is hedonic adaptation and how does it fit into the scientific art of cultivating happiness? Right. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, there was a, there was a time period that I really thought that hedonic adaptation was like the most important construct that we all should, should understand. And I still think it's really important. So, so adaptation is the idea that human beings are remarkably good at getting used to changes in their lives, you know, both positive and negative, but especially positive changes, right? So when, you know, when we get a raise at work or we get a new job, we move to a new city, we start a new relationship, we have a baby, um, we buy something new, we buy a new car, a new bag. At first it gives us, the, I'm, I'm, I, these are all examples of positive changes. At first it gives us a, a happiness boost, right? Like we're so happy. We have this new job that we've wanted to have. We've, we have this new car that we've, we've been looking forward to, but that boost doesn't, doesn't sort of stay forever. You know, we tend to kind of go back to our happiness baseline. Um, same thing for net ne for negative changes is a really good thing, right? That, that human beings are really resilient and we, we tend to kind of adapt even to negative changes when we lose our job 
or when we lose money, when we, our relationship breaks up. Now, adaptation doesn't have to be complete. And so for certain kinds of events, especially negative events, like when you, people who um, acquire disabilities or actually unemployment tends to be something that people don't tend to, especially men as opposed to women, don't tend to adapt to completely. So we may never kind of go back to our previous baseline. With positive events, we tend to go back to our previous baseline. Um, marriage is a really excellent example. You know, marriage for many people is sort of the best thing that they've done, you know, in a way, um, in terms of how it brings lots of good things to them. But but sh studies show that, you know, if you follow people over across time, that after about a two-year average period, people tend to go back to baseline, although the baseline tends to be inflated. But that's not true for everyone. There are individual differences. For some people, kind of never go back. Uh, they kind of go hot up and stay up. And so adaptation is a really powerful phenomenon and a very important one to think about with regard to the pursuit of happiness because it, it sort of it sort of opposes kind of a, a, a puzzle that if we adapt to almost everything positive that ever happens to us, then how can we ever become happier, right? Um, and so that, that that is a really important question. And and sort of one answer is that we don't adapt completely to everything. So, and that, and then we can actually try to slow down or try to prevent adaptation, right? So if we buy a new car, you know, if we could try to use it in ways, we could try to think about it in ways where we try not to adapt to it. Like, you know, gratitude is actually a great example, expressing gratitude for the things that we have, whether it's our car or our marriage or our house or our new job um, is an antidote to hedonic adaptation. Because basically when you're grateful for something, you're basically not taking it for granted. So adaptation is basically taking things for granted. And so we try, so we can kind of take active steps to try not to take things for granted. Yeah. So kind of in infusing variety and then appreciation into the positive experiences that we have helps them to last longer. One other thing that I thought was so cool that you cited in, in your books, and I was just reading some studies this morning about it, is the power of interruption to have, having like our pleasurable experience interrupted. And so I write a lot about working parenthood. And one of the challenges in working parenthood is that we're often sort of cut off, like we, we get into flow uh, while writing and we got to go pick up the kids or we're with our kids and having a good time and we have to get them out the door so that they can be on time to, to their school. And it's just kind of fascinating how um, I think a lot of the research comes from marketing research, but that, for example, if you're watching TV and it is interrupted by commercials, we actually tend to enjoy the show the show more than if it's not interrupted by commercials. And I wonder how um, I wonder if you've sort of explored that in in your work. That's such a great question. I haven't explored in my work, but I, I have not made the um, connection to to sort of working parenthood, which is a really interesting connection. That you say that you're right. There's there's so much interruption or just anyone who has like a really busy life, you know, yeah. kind of by definition, there's going to be so many, you're multitasking, you're doing so many things that there's a lot of interruptions. And so the research suggests that, that, that interrupting positive experiences is actually good because it kind of resets your kind of um, set like adaptation point. So like you're, as you said, like you're, you're having fun with your kids and then suddenly you have to stop and put them to bed or, you know, bring them to school or bring them to the dentist. And, and, but, but, but the, what the research suggests is that when we're having fun with our kids, we kind of adapt to it. Right. So like that, the more we're doing the same kind of activity, the kind of, maybe it's still fun, but it's not as fun, like an hour or two or three hours into it as it was for the, the beginning of it. And same thing with watching a movie. Um, Oh, right. We're binging out on Netflix. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but exactly. Like, it, it's why actually we shouldn't binge, binge watch on Netflix. Like, my husband and I love the show Succession. So, and now we have to like wait a week until every episode. And, um, and it's actually good to wait, right? Because then you're just, right, you're interrupting that pleasure. But if you kind of watch it all together, then it's still really pleasurable. Um, but it, if you kind of like, uh, added up the units of pleasure, whether it's watching a show or, or being, being with your kids, the units of pleasure would actually be higher with interruption. So actually, I'm glad that you, you're saying this because it makes me feel better now um, about my life and, and like I guess a lot of people's life that, that involves a lot of interruptions. But when it comes to negative experiences, you don't want to interrupt them. And so actually, I was just thinking about this because I'm going to the dentist today for the first time in a long time since COVID. I, I sort of had to change dentists. And, and sometimes when you have like a now, hopefully I'm not going to have like any kind of painful procedure, but if you have like a painful dental procedure, I used to have a dentist who would keep interrupting it, kind of give you a break. And so they, they have this very faulty assumption 
that like having breaks actually makes it better, but it does not make it better because you just kind of want to get it over with, right? You want to aggregate negative, this is another uh, research that I remember reading about in grad school. You want to aggregate negative events and segregate positive events, kind of like academics understand this. Um, if you're going to get two rejections from two different journals, um, it's better to get them all in a single day because uh, it kind of ruins one day a lot, but other ways you, you ruin two different months. Um, if you want to get two acceptances from two different journals, it's better to spread them out and so have two kind of positive events. So, so aggregate negative, so negative, put negative things together. If you have a lot of negative things to do, just put them in all in one day, as long as it's not too much and you're overwhelmed and separate positive things. Right. So aggregate negative and separate positive. I, I love that tip. And you have you have another set of tips that I think is really cool for optimizing happiness um, that I wanted to ask you about. So how should we handle positive memories and experiences versus negative memories and experiences? Mm -hmm. the, sure. the, the advice is different. Right. So there's, there's a, a, again, there's an asymmetry of how what to do with sort of positive versus negative memories. Um, and there's a couple of ways of thinking about it. So one way, I'm not sure which paper, because there's two different papers that I have that are relevant. One is with actually a, an Israeli researcher and one is with not. But I'll, I'll start with the first one, which is that when you're thinking about um, positive things, it's better to, to play them out in our minds, kind of like a video camera, like a videotape. And so imagine like the happiest day of your life. Maybe it's your wedding day. And so when you're remembering your wedding day, you kind of want to like replay it, sort of think about like, you know, what happened, kind of like a, a videotape that you're playing back to yourself. And that's going to make you happy. When it comes to um, negative things, you don't want to do that. Uh, I mean, unless you're sort of in therapy and you're trying to, I don't know, process something. Um, because playing like a really, really bad day back to yourself is just going to make you feel terrible, right? It's going to put you right into it. Um, but for negative experiences, you really want to like process them and try to analyze them. So basically the advice is you want to analyze negative things, but you want to kind of replay positive. So you want to ruminate Rumination is basically replaying. You want to kind of replay positive things and analyze negative things. Because when you analyze negative experiences, you might come to terms with them. You might sort of try to understand them, get past them. But you don't want to analyze positive experiences. You don't want to ask yourself, gee, why why was I happy at my wedding? And and were other people happy there too? Like you don't want to analyze positive things too much. So that's, that's one piece of advice about positive and negative. The other piece of advice comes from another paper that I have that I really love. It has to do with what we call, um, or other researchers call, endowment versus contrast effects. And that is that when something really good happens to you, you kind of want to like put it in your bank of experiences. Like imagine you have like a really amazing meal and it's one of the best meals you've ever had. For my 40th birthday, my husband took me to this restaurant that's like considered one of the best restaurants in the world. And and so I'm like, that was such an amazing, and also my two best friends were there kind of as a surprise. So it was a really amazing day. Mm -hmm. And so I remember that day in that restaurant and I kind of, it's, it, I, 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 I endow it. So basically I put it in the bank of experiences. So my life is sort of richer. It's better having had that experience. Now, what I don't want to do with positive experiences, I don't want to contrast them to other things, right? So if I have this like amazing meal, best I've ever had, you could, you could argue that every you know, subsequent restaurant meal is not going to be as enjoyable, right? Because I'm always going to compare it to that one. It's never going to be as good. So I don't want to contrast that. So I, so when it comes to positive experiences, you want to endow them and not contrast them. For negative experiences, the other way around, right? So if I have like, uh, if someone experiences like, say, they're they're mugged on the street, you know, and their wallet is stolen, it's very, it's traumatic. You, you, you don't want to put that in the bank of experiences because your life is just going to be like worse off because of it. You don't want to endow it. But you, kind of, but you can contrast it and say like, gee, that was horrible. That happened, say, 10 years ago. You know, since then, you know, that has not happened. So it's, like, it's kind of like my life is better since then. You know, it has not happened. And so you sort of want to contrast negative experiences, but you want to endow positive experiences. If you're looking for a great way to support us here at Psychologists Off the Clock and make your life easier and healthier, you should go to my new favorite online store, Thrive Market. Thrive Market carries all your grocery and household essentials with the convenience of getting everything online and then quickly shipped right to your door. And right now you can get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift if you go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC. I love that I can use specific filters to curate my shopping experience so I can find organic meats and low sugar snacks for my kids. Plus when you join, they give to a family in need. How cool is that? So join in on the savings with Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order plus a free $60 gift. 
Go to thrivemarket.com slash POTC for 30% off plus a free $60 gift. That's T-H-R-I-V-E market.com slash P-O-T-C, thrivemarket.com slash P-O-T-C. I know I talk about my kids a lot, but I also have two adorable dogs, Tilly and Hazel. We love to spoil them, which is why we love Whole Life Pet. Whole Life Pet makes single ingredient treats, meal mixers, supplements, and hydrating snacks for both dogs and cats. And if you try out Whole Life Pet, you're surprising your pets with fun new flavors while also supporting psychologists off the clock. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. When I open the Tuscan Blend Bistro Bowl meal mixer to add to Tilly and Hazel's food, they start wildly sniffing and can't wait to dig in. The best part is Whole Life Pet uses a freeze-dried process that locks in nutrients and freshness, and they never add chemicals, additives, preservatives, or anything artificial. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off your first order with free shipping over $50. If you're unsure about what to try, you can fill out their short questionnaire by clicking the red Start Today button on the home page. It will ask you a few questions and make custom product recommendations for your pets. Visit wholelifepet.com and use promo code POTC to get 25% off today. We've had a number of guests who want to offer you, our listeners, discounted access to some of their fantastic programs. So if you want to learn powerful practices for happiness, calm, and well-being, we have several offerings from Rick Hansen. If you want app-based behavior change, you can check out Judd Brewer's apps for anxiety, eating well, and smoking cessation. Or you can learn how to be a calmer parent with Mindful Mama mentor Hunter Clark Fields. So go to our website, offtheclockpsych.com, and visit our offers page, where you will find access to free courses and discount promo codes. What I love about your work is that there is really a lot of opportunity to kind of tailor the the way that you optimize your happiness, depending on who you are and how you are and what the circumstances are. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the folks who sort of have a harder time with happiness, either because they have depressive symptoms or or they just have this sort of foreboding around happiness. So for example, some people experience a happy moment and then immediately following, there's sort of like a, what's going to happen now? The other shoe's going to drop. And I know some of your research explores interventions with dysphoric individuals. So I'm curious what kind of happiness activities you found to work better and which work less well for individuals who have that kind of disposition or, or sort of temperament? Mm-hmm. Well, it's a great question because I think the people who you could argue, the people who are most in need of happiness interventions are those who are, you know, not just sort of a little bit unhappy, kind of who want to be happier, but, um, you know, who are quite unhappy or who might be dysphoric or depressed. And there's now quite a few studies that clinical researchers are doing with clinical populations. Some of them, I, I've partnered with some of them to do some studies, um, I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I, you know, I, I can speak to that on, on that subject. And I guess the first, my first answer is I think pretty much the same types of positive strategies or activities would apply to dysphoric or depressed or anxious individuals as they would apply to sort of healthy individuals. So, so you know, whether it's um, you know the kinds of activities that I study are you know expressing gratitude, you know, engaging in kind of social interactions, pro-social or kind acts. Um, and, you know, other, lots of other people study things like savoring the good things in your life, uh, physical exercise, pursuing goals. So there's lots of things one can do to be happy. And I think they're very similar, no matter whether you're sort of depressed or anxious or where, whether you're, you're not. Um, and I think, but I think what matters is fit, right? If you're, um, you know, maybe very depressed and you're having trouble kind of just getting out of the house, you know, maybe like going out and, you know, engaging in lots of social interactions outside, you know, may not be a fitting activity for you. So, and so, so you, ha- you might have to sort of tailor the activities to the person or to the population, but really to the person because every person is different, right? So if you're an introvert, maybe going out and being extroverted is going to be super hard. Although we have a study that shows that even introverts benefit from acting extroverted. And then there's some kind of more serious caveats that I haven't studied yet, but I would like to study. And that is sometimes some positive activities might actually backfire for certain individuals and for certain populations. So an easy example is, um, you know, we, we do lots of studies showing that doing acts of kindness for others makes people happier. So not only do you benefit the other person, but you feel good as a person. You you make this connection with others. You feel good about sort of the world at large, humanity. Um, 
But what if you're someone who's like already so giving, like you're just, in fact, a lot of women tend to kind of ignore their own self-care to being really, really giving to others. Like if you're already really giving, then telling them to sort of be even more giving is is not going to help and may even backfire, right? So maybe they really need to focus on themselves. Um, another example is gratitude. So I think gratitude is one of the most important things that we can do to try to sort of to be happy and sort of to be satisfied with our lives, to really appreciate what we have and to, to, to express gratitude to people in our lives. But gratitude can back, backfire as well. When we express gratitude, sometimes it can make us feel embarrassed. Um, it could make us feel um, like, like we, we're not sort of so successful or happy after all, because it's not about us. It's about sort of other people's help. But I think one thing that's really that's really serious is it can make us feel indebted. And in fact, in some languages, the word grateful is the same as the word indebted. Um, kind of by definition, when you're grateful to someone else, you sort of feel a little bit indebted to them. Now, I do research showing that when you feel indebted and grateful, you actually might actually inspire you to pay back, to prove yourself worthy to the person, to make themselves proud. So that's good, right? So gratitude can actually make you want to be a better person and eat more healthfully and you know work harder and be kinder. But what if you're very, very depressed? So some research shows that people who are very depressed and especially people who are suicidal, they feel like one of the reasons they feel this way is that they feel like that they're a burden or maybe one of the correlates is that they feel that they're a burden on their family and friends. And so one reason that they report that they want to end their lives is they feel that they're a burden on their family and friends. So if you if people are severely depressed, asking them to, to express gratitude for their family and friends might actually make them feel even more of a burden, right? So that would be totally counterproductive, might really backfire. And so those are the kinds of nuances that I think is important to consider when you try to apply kind of positive activity interventions that I and other people mostly study with sort of healthy individuals and when you try to apply them to clinical populations. Yeah, absolutely. That that fit is is so key. The other finding that I thought was really fascinating about gratitude, I think in one of your studies, you examined dosage effects. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that, you know, some of these happiness activities are good, broadly speaking, but but it's interesting to think just like taking medication, we want to be sort of careful about how and how often we apply them. Absolutely. In fact, when I talk about my happiness interventions to lay audiences, I often use the word clinical trial. They're not actually technically clinical trials, but they're similar. And that now everyone kind of knows what a clinical trial is because they're following like vaccine trials. And so right. clinical trials, of course, are, are looking at dosage and fit. You know, some people might not need, might not be able to take this vaccine and, and, and we need to know what the proper dosage is. For, for different age groups, for different, you know, individual types of individuals. Um, and so the same thing like with gratitude. So we did a study where we showed that expressing gratitude once a week or counting blessings once a week made people happier, but, but expressing counting blessings three times a week didn't do anything. It did have a, it didn't backfire either, but maybe it was too often, maybe it became monotonous. And so we actually just, uh, or not just, uh, we, we, we did a study where we actually very, how many blessings we ask people to count, right? So in one condition, we ask people to think of two things that you're grateful for. In another, we ask people to think of four things that you're grateful for. So we had two, four, eight, 16, and 32 blessings. One condition, we actually ask people to think of 32 things to be grateful for. Um, wow, that's, that's, that's intense. <laughs> that's a lot, exactly, exactly. So, so um, uh, there's, a, there's a heuristic called the effort as information heuristic that judgment decision-making um, researchers have studied, which basically suggests that sometimes if it takes you a lot of effort to do something, that that is kind of a clue to sort of what that means to you. So for example, with gratitude, if I ask you, think of 30 things, 32 things in your life that, you, that make you fortunate, and you have trouble thinking of 32 things, you might actually conclude that maybe you don't have a lot of in your life to be fortunate about, right? To feel fortunate about. So it actually might backfire. And so in that particular study, well, I don't know, maybe I could have you guess, what, which one, which do you think two, four, eight, 16 or 32 blessings was kind of the optimal dosage? Four. And that's a great guess, actually, because that was most of people's guess. And it was eight in that particular study. Okay. It was eight blessings, but yeah, four, five, I feel like. Um, but that's we're, we're, yeah, it's interesting. And we're replicating that right now where we're actually randomly assigning people out of like from between one and a hundred, uh, um, how many blessings to count. And so, um, or is it one in 50? A hundred is a lot. Um, anyway, so we're trying to replicate that, but, but the key point is that there is going to be an optimal dosage pretty much to everything, to, to medication, but also to kindness and to gratitude 
physical exercise, almost anything, right? We there's kind of I really I'm a, I'm a real believer in kind of Aristotle's idea of the kind of the golden mean that there's sort of moderation and everything. And one of my examples actually comes from kids. My oldest kid who is now 22, when she was little, that's what that's when the Harry Potter books were just kind of coming out. I mean, they're like half of them were written, but like not all of them were written. So it's actually very exciting to wait for the next Harry Potter book. And so I got into reading Harry Potter with her, which was like so wonderful and very connecting. And we both really enjoyed the books, but we were doing it too much. And my husband at one point said, he's like, Sonia, you really need to like, you're like neglecting your other responsibilities. You're spending too much time reading to Gabriella, which, and I, and you think like, but how could, how could even reading to your kid be too much, but there could be too much of a good thing. Right. So, so there, there, there's an optimal dosage to pretty much any activity in life, including kind of happiness activities. Yeah. And I think Paul Bloom's new book is actually called the sweet spot, which I think is a really nice way to capture this idea of that Aristotelian mean where we don't want to do too much of a good thing because we'll habituate or it'll sort of backfire in some way. And and so I think discussing some of these myths that we have about, you know, what should make us happy and what shouldn't helps us to locate that sweet spot more effectively. Exactly. You know, the sweet spot, it's a great title. Um, or sometimes I think of like the Goldilocks, you know, like idea sort of like the 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 bed that's just right, you know, or uh, the just right dosage. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So this is kind of a working parent question or more broadly speaking, just a you know, if you are living a very demanding life with a lot of roles and not a lot of time and recognizing that there's a fit issue and a dosage issue, I mean, what are your sort of go-tos of where people can begin to cultivate greater happiness mm-hmm. in their lives? Um, well, I, I think one thing to keep in mind is that the pursuit of happiness doesn't have to take a lot of time. You know, it's, you know, when you think about like fitness, you know, we go to the gym or we like go running or swimming or whatever, and it takes time out of our day. And then, and when you're a working parent, like that's really hard. And, and of course you could try to like, I don't know, work out with your baby. I mean, there's things like that, but I, I used to actually run with a, you know, jogging stroller a lot, like to try to combine it. But, and, but you can do the same kind of thing. Maybe this is a, maybe not a bad metaphor. You can have, you can like have like a jogging stroller for happiness. And that is, while you're, you know, I don't know, taking a walk with your kids or doing something with your kids, like you can, you can practice some of these strategies and it could be gratitude, for example, like you could like think about like how grateful you are for this or that, or look on the positive side of things or savor something. Or while you're walking from work, you might do an act of kindness, you know, for a stranger uh, that, that doesn't have to take a lot of time, right. Or effort. So so a lot of sort of positive activities don't have to, again, sort of take time out of your day. They can be kind of incorporated into your day. It doesn't mean that it doesn't take effort. Like if looking on the bright side of things doesn't come naturally to you, doesn't come easily to you, that's really hard, right? Like something happens, like, I don't know, your manager gives you some negative feedback and you're just like, you know, you just feel bad, right? And so it's really hard to kind of be like, you know what, maybe, okay, maybe this is this is good that I got this feedback because now I've learn my lesson. I feel like many of us, like, I think I'm fairly good at it, but it takes me some time. Right. I'm like, I mean, I, after a while, I'm like, okay, I'm glad I, I'm glad I got that feel. Like I made that mistake. Like, this is a silly example, but I, I had a phone call the other day to Australia and I did, I made the phone call in the wrong way and it cost me $80. And I'm like, damn, $80 just went out the window. And I'm like, but it took me a bit and I'm like, okay, I've learned my lesson. Okay. I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to do that anymore. And so, but anyway, so, but it doesn't take like a lot of time out of your day. So again, there's lots of strategies to incorporate and kind of fold in into their work time or their commute time or their time with their kids to cultivate happiness. Yeah. So it's kind of like stacking some of those activities into things that you're already doing in ways that don't feel so burdensome, it, recognizing that it does take effort, especially if you haven't built the muscles for it. Mm-hmm. And I really love that example of the phone call to Australia because it's such a nice, I, I think that that's a nice example of how a happiness mindset and, and knowing that you can sort of turn a difficult experience into something good really opens you up to sort of reframe that experience. And, and again, being open to looking at things in new ways or engaging in behaviors that work better for fostering greater happiness is is just such a powerful thing. So I recognize that we're just about out of time and I just wanted to thank you so much. We'll link to your website and your amazing books. And um, I just wanted to thank you again for making time in your busy schedule to meet with me. 
Thank you so much, Yale. And I you know I, I really enjoyed uh, the questions that you were asking and really delving into the details of the research and of the implications. So thank you. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our strategic consultant, Michael Harold, our dissemination coordinator, Katie Rothfelder, and our editorial coordinator, Melissa Miller. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of our webpage, offtheclockpsych.com.